Hi friends, David here from Learn Christmas Lighting and today we're here, we got the whiteboard out, we're excited because what I want to bring to you guys is kind of a, a master class, a kind of everything that you need to know about using DMX in an animated Christmas light show. It's no secret that over the past few years, things like DMX moving heads, um, starting with many people using uh, indoor units in domes, then a few years ago our Domi and Beam came out, uh, there's other models on the market, and these DMX moving heads have become really popular in Christmas light shows. Not only that, but things like fog machines, static wash lights, um, spark machines, all sorts of stuff continues to become more and more popular in this hobby and they all run on DMX. Now to give you a little background, I've been using DMX my entire career. I started in stage lighting, it's been my career uh, aside to teaching Christmas lighting here and spent hours upon hours upon hours upon hours, years upon years working with DMX and I know it well. But I realize and what I've learned is as this hobby grows and as the use of moving heads in this hobby grows, a lot of people are coming at it from knowing pixels and DMX can seem confusing, but it's actually really stinking simple. And we're going to walk through everything you need to know about DMX here today from this video. So I want to start with the most basic things. So for example, here I have a Dominar Lampa. It's our lamp based uh, unit that we sell at Learn Christmas Lighting. We put them in the domes. They're awesome. Um, now they're 295 watts. Um, they're really bright, really fast, really high quality. Um, and like most DMX fixtures, you have for yourself a DMX input and output with, in this case, a three pin XLR plug. Throughout this video, what I want to do is basically go over all the basics of DMX, cover how it pertains to the Christmas lighting world, and talk about what you need to know, bust a bunch of myths about DMX, okay? So DMX is a signal, okay, based upon the type of signal, the protocol, called RS-485. Now, you don't really need to know this, but it is really helpful um, just because different controllers and whatnot in, in the Christmas light world might sometimes say that they have RS-485, right? And if they say they have RS-485, that means essentially they're able to talk DMX. Okay, for example, things like Lightorama, those old uh, control boxes that a lot of people use um, with conventional type lights, they talk about the LOR network, right? And so we'll just bust some myths quick here. The LOR network, um, and then we also have DMX, okay? Now, essentially, uh, from a layman's terms, and I know there's some nuance here that somebody will point in the comments about, um, these are essentially all compatible. There, we'll say they're all compatible because they're not all the same. Okay, RS-485 is kind of the base protocol. DMX is built on top of that, but any RS-485 type signaling device that can transmit that, that signal um, is going to work with DMX. Okay, what about Lightorama versus DMX, okay? Um, because a lot of times you read, especially in Lightorama's literature and, and tutorials, they'll talk about, hey, your Lightorama network and these IDs and converting to DMX, and it can really confuse the snot out of people. Okay, this is really, really, really simple. Get ready for this. Lightorama is DMX, okay? But you might say, hey, wait. Lightorama works on a RJ45 plug, and DMX works on a 3-pin XLR type plug. So what's the deal there, right? Because one is your typical network cable, I don't have one handy, and the other is DMX cable, right? And here I've got a handy adapter. Okay, so what's going to be the difference? Well, where am I? <laughs> well, as a short aside, the plug really doesn't matter with DMX. DMX can technically be transmitted on pretty much any type of digital cable. Coming out of your controllers, more often than not, um, a good example for this is to show you a Falcon controller. This is an old F4, right? Um, but even today's Falcon controllers, when this is being recorded, they have a port on them, a RJ45 port for Lightorama slash DMX. Why? Because they're the same thing. 
then how come if I plug into a Lightorama port, how come it doesn't work? Well, uh, on the Falcons, there's actually some jumpers that allow you to switch it between Lightorama and DMX mode. The only difference between them is the fact that Lightorama uh, sends it down pins 4, 5, and 6 of the RJ45, the Ethernet cable. DMX uses pins 1, 2, and 3. So that's why you can't just go plug things in together and make it work. But it's a very simple switch. Things like the Falcons make it just, you know, make the adapter happen. Um, and there's no problem. Okay, uh, more on that in a second. So let's talk about, while we're here, getting DMX out of a controller for your lights, right? Because whether your lights have three pin, five pin, whether they have a terminal block on them, whether they have an RJ45 plug, they're all talking DMX, right? And so how do we get that out of a controller into our lights? Well, as I mentioned here, one example is on the Falcons, you have an RJ45 plug. On other controllers, like the Culps, uh, some, some of the Culps, other ones, you may have a what is a, uh, a terminal block, just one of these green little blocks, right? Like you've got on Falcons on most of these controllers where you can insert wires directly. Um, in that case, instead of using Ethernet cable, more often than not, I mean, you could strip Ethernet cable. It's not the most fun hobby in the world, but it works. But you would often just take a DMX cable, strip off the end, and insert those wires accordingly, pin one being the shield, and then two and three being whatever they are, plus and minus. Pin three is positive, I believe, but you can just Google that DMX wiring scheme. It'll show right up. Okay, so how do you convert between them, right? Like if you happen to have yourself a controller that has an output like this, that has a RJ45, and you need it to be three or five pin, how do you adapt it? Okay, um, online, again, I wanna cut through some BS here that I've seen online, is you'll see different vendors selling a adapter and they'll call it like x lights certified. Why do I even write? Um, x lights certified, right? That honestly is just a made up term that doesn't mean anything. And I don't mean to throw some of my friends and vendors under the bus, but it's kind of ridiculous. Um, there's no such thing as x lights certified. However, more importantly, and I'm just going to pull up my spec sheet real quick so I don't say anything incorrectly. There is an organization called, so we're just going to cross that out, called the ESTA, if you're following along at home. And they are a standards body from the entertainment industry. And the reason this whole x -Lite certified business came out is because when it comes to converting DMX, you can convert three to five pin, that's really simple. You can convert Ethernet RJ45 to DMX cable, and that's pretty simple. But the problem is, if you go on Amazon, which unfortunately over the past few years when it comes to DMX devices has kind of become low bidder central and there's just a lot of like terrible stuff out there. Because you go to Amazon, you buy a XLR or a DMX to RJ45 adapter and it does not follow the ESTA standard for DMX over RJ45, which is pins one, two, and three uh, being connected to uh, white brown orange and white orange and I'm reading that off the chart so I get it right okay that is the correct wiring as specified in the entertainment industry for DMX to XLR okay to a two or DMX to RJ45 sorry more coffee David so when somebody says when there's vendors out there that say it's X lights certified there's no such thing as X lights certified because X lights doesn't specify a pinout for the DMX right the controllers do but the controllers at least the Falcons which is the most common that has the the RJ45 plug on them when they specify the output they follow hey the established standard imagine that right um, and the established standard is as such so don't worry so much about a if you're having to adapt between RJ45 and XLR, um, that's the big one, is we see this a lot with moving head support is that people go and they get an adapter off Amazon that's just like some generic name, it's real cheap. Uh, oftentimes it's not even cheaper actually. They go and buy it and then they're like, hey, my lights aren't working, they're not detecting DMX. A lot of times it's just some random factory just put the, made the pins just random on the adapter and they didn't follow 
the standard, right? If they followed the standard, you'd be good because the Falcons followed the standard. So that being said, you know, there's lots of people selling x certified adapters. I don't love those adapters for a couple reasons. Um, a lot of them from a lot of these vendors, just as an aside, have a, let's go to our side cam, have a, uh, have a wire with an XLR plug and an RJ45 plug with the, with the tab on it that can break off uh, real easily. What we have is we have the AccuCable ones. Okay, this is a major brand in the stage lighting industry. They're very inexpensive. Um, like the set of two of them for both ways is like $14 at the time of this recording. And what I love is there's nothing to break on this adapter, right? It's a barrel plug with a uh, receiving end on the male RJ45, I guess it would be. Um, where's the female? I guess the female RJ45. And the XLR so that there's no there's no nothing to break off on the RJ45 side nothing to break off on the XLR side and you can connect this with a small RJ45 jump just a small Ethernet cable inside your controller box and not have a non waterproof connector coming outside of your controller box when you do run DMX over RJ45 there is a theoretical limit of 300 meters or around a thousand feet that being said DMX itself let's get into DMX wiring here can go much much longer I believe the spec is 1800 or 18,000 feet we can flash it on the screen um, DMX does go a long distance and it does do that well so let's talk about wiring DMX basics, okay? So DMX wiring and setup is gonna be a little bit different than your Pixel, and this can throw some people for a loop, but it's actually, I think it's easier. Um, um, but it's probably because I've been using it for so long, right? So say you have, first of all, you've got a controller, we'll make that this square, right? And it's outputting DMX, okay? So you've got DMX cable coming out of that controller into your fixtures, right? Now you've got fixtures, so let's just say we have four moving heads, okay? DMX works what's called on what's called a daisy chain, um, but technically it's actually what's called a bus protocol. So it's a bus protocol and a daisy chain. Kind of confusing, what does that mean? Okay, um, so DMX essentially comes in and out of fixtures, okay? So every fixture you buy, okay, whether it be a moving head, a wash light, a fog machine, whatever, has a DMX input and DMX output on it. Now, unlike pixels, it's not technically a directional DMX input and output. Like from a wiring perspective, we go in and we go out, right? And we move along and we put cables between all of our fixtures and voila, they're now connected. They're now ready to go on DMX, right? In, out, I, O, I, O. I, oh, it's off to work we go, right? Uh, just like the seven dwarfs, that's who says that. But it's actually technically just a bus topology where instead of going through everything, it's literally just going the whole way along and it stops off inside of every fixture like that, okay? So if you ever run into a fixture, uh, typically more architectural style lights that just have a terminal block and it just says DMX, you connect both the in and out to that same cable. Similarly, if you end up in a pinch, sometimes this happens, where you have some funky adapters or some fixtures that are labeled wrong. This can happen with the China Direct stuff sometimes. You might go from your controller into a DMX output, out the DMX input, and through the chain. Guess what? It'll work all day long. Why? Because it's not like a pixel where the signal comes in, gets regenerated, and gets pushed back out. It's that all the fixtures are sitting along a highway and the, the data stops off at each one, okay? Um, so then the question becomes, if this is different than pixels, um, and this is a really key thing, how do I make each moving head do its own unique thing? This is where DMX has a concept called addresses, okay? So you've probably seen this in, in controllers, in the visualizer, in x lights, etc. You'll see you have universe and addresses for each port on your controllers, typically, right? That's if you're using E131 or Artnet. With GDP, it's different. It's just straight channels, right? But for E131 or Artnet, you see this universe and channel nomenclature going on, okay? That comes from stage lighting. That comes from DMX. So DMX, when it comes out of a controller and it's a DMX cable, it has one thing to it. 
It has addresses, okay, addresses. It does not have, when it's running, when it's come out of your controller and it's on a cable, okay, that signal that's being transmitted does not have a universe, okay? It just has addresses. What addresses does it have? It has one through 512. That's the amount of channels you have to work with inside of DMX, okay? Every device you have will use typically a channel per function. Now these are 8-bit functions, so let's talk about moving heads. A lot of times things like your pan and tilt, your movement, are 16-bit and they use two channels, okay? So regardless of that, um, a lot of times your moving heads may take, you know, 16, 14, 13 channels, somewhere in that range for moving beam lights. That's, that's pretty common. And so out of 512, you can fit as many lights in there as you possibly can out of those addresses. And that's how much can get plugged into a single DMX cable, okay? Um, in terms of addressing. There's also a couple other limits. One is in a typical daisy chain between different fixtures, um, you are technically limited to 32 fixtures. That's a little bit, it's a little bit weird because that's the way the spec lands, but if you use a DMX splitter or if yeah, some, that 32 number is just, it's in the spec and it's true, but sometimes you can actually run more fixtures, sometimes you can run less fixtures, um, but it's an approximation. So you can run 32 fixtures in a daisy chain. Again, you know, this is Christmas lighting, so a lot of people aren't getting that, that high of numbers, um, at which point you would need to split the DMX, or if you're on different channels, just get a different universe of DMX out of your controller, you're ready to roll. So addresses, we were back at addresses, let's not get lost in that. The address is how the light knows what to do, okay? Because every light that's coming out of the controller receives all 512 channels of data that's being transmitted, okay? How do they know what to do? Well, you set the address and sometimes also the mode of the fixture on the light itself, okay? So you get into the menus on the LCD, you set those items. You match them to whatever the visualizer in X lights typically has set them to. You typically do that first, then set it in the lights, okay? So then it's just as simple as setting the addresses. So we'll switch colors just so it's a little more clear. So say we have address one, okay, say it's a 14 channel fixture. So then we're at 15, 29, 43, if I did the math right. And so those are gonna be your addresses. So the order of the fixtures in the wiring actually has nothing to do with how it responds to DMX, right? We can literally go and go, hey, we could do them that way, but we could also do them 129, then 15, then 43. I don't know why you'd do it that way, but the point is that, that the fixture's wiring order has nothing to do with how they respond to DMX, which is completely backwards from pixels. So if you're in the Christmas light space, you're used to working with pixels, you might go, hey David, this is so whacked. Why, you know, why does it work that way? Well, it, because it's different, right? Um, and so the address is key, but then it frees you up because who cares what order you wire it in? It's gonna listen to that address all day long. You also can, though I don't recommend it a lot of times, but you can, set two lights to the same address and they will do the exact same thing, okay? Again, not typically recommended, but it can be done. That's really the basics of DMX. Essentially, DMX lights are gonna work as long as they're receiving valid data and they're on. DMX lights will pass data when powered down, okay? Because again, it's a bus driving by, it's a highway, it's not an in and out that's being retransmitted. So unlike pixels, you get a bad pixel, you have a pixel powered off, um, per se, it doesn't pass data, right? DMX devices, the data always goes through them all day long. What else? Um, you know, I think that's basically it. Essentially, when it comes to DMX, uh, a lot of people get confused, especially with moving heads, um, and it can seem complicated. Oh, that's what else I want to touch on, cabling. So like I mentioned before, it's very popular in this hobby to use an ethernet cable for DMX, come out of your controller, use a running ethernet, and get to the fixture itself. Awesome, that's great. When it comes to going between fixtures or just any runs of DMX cable, there is a difference between XLR and DMX. So many of you may know, you know, the three pin plug that many of the lights in our hobby have, um, though technically DMX is only five pin, looks like this. 
Okay, it's a three pin XLR plug. The same plug is used for microphones, okay, um, and audio signals. But um, audio cable, typical microphone cable, is not rated to carry a digital signal. Will it work? Will the cables plug together? Will DMX come out of this controller and go through a microphone cable between lights? Sure, it will. However, um, very important key here is you have about half the capacitance of the DMX cable. And what that means basically is that your signal, instead of being 32 fixtures maximum as the DMX spec calls for and typically works, the amount of fixtures you can do before you start to have issues is gonna be much, much less. Okay, typically about half. So it can technically work, it's not a good idea in the long run. What about weather proofiness? XLR, a typical three pin or five pin XLR or DMX plug is not weatherproof. When it comes to getting weatherproof, they'll either be a plastic screw together plug or there are metal versions that have a rubber ring on the outside that technically make them more waterproof. Now, all that to say, that's what we have on the Dominars, um, etc. Does that mean if you use a regular DMX cable that's not weatherproof that all your stuff's gonna fail and it's just not gonna work? No. Uh, <laughs> more often than not, if these things aren't sitting in puddles of water, they're gonna be absolutely fine. But I say that because if you're connecting to a fixture that is waterproof plugs, I would use the waterproof connector with the extra rubber bushing. If you're using the screw together plugs, you'll need adapters. They should come with your fixture. If they don't, your vendor's not cool. Um, we supply them with everything. But essentially, a DMX cable is a DMX cable and it'll work. Couple other random things to hit that I missed in the first <laughs> recording. So um, another great way, by the way, to get DMX out of your system is the Pixel 2 DMX from Experience Lights. I have literally no relationship with them other than saying hi to them, being friendly as another vendor in the industry, but it allows you to basically plug in the end of a Pixel string. Um, I believe it has to be 12 volt. Um, and then you get a DMX three pin plug. It uses the rest of the DMX universe and you configure it in XLITs as such. It's pretty darn easy and really cool. What about termination? Okay, so DMX termination um, as per the spec is that basically between pins two and three of the DMX plug at the last fixture, you are supposed to put a uh, 120 ohm resistor between them. And I'm gonna, it's gonna be these two, right? You're supposed to put that resistor between them to stop DMX essentially from bouncing back and causing problems uh, with your DMX. It's in about every user manual for every DMX fixture from a major manufacturer. Um, but it's one of those things that being in stage lighting and having worked for DMX for years, I can tell you very few people actually use it on a practical day-to-day -day level. Okay, why? Um, so like most things I would say that are built into specifications, kind of like, um, you know, when you go and look at Cat5e cable, that's something that's in this hobby a lot. Uh, people will go, Hey, Cat5e is only rated to such and such a speed. You know, it's not gigabit cable or whatever they say, right? Um, I don't have the exact spec off the top of my hands. Okay. But what you have to remember is anything that's contained in a spec like that is guaranteed to meet that spec at the maximum length of that cable, right? At maximum usage, as, as if you push the protocol as hard as you can, that that's gonna always be true, right? So you can find, for example, in that example with Cat5 cable, um, as I've been told by networking folks that I work with a lot, is you know you can get all the speed you want out of a shorter Cat5 cable. It's just if it's at the maximum length, you're only get, gonna get what it's rated for, okay? DMX termination is kind of like that. You'll find in the professional industry, they're very seldomly used. Um, sometimes they technically cause problems. Sometimes they solve problems. Um, they can be something to use if you have fixtures that are kind of working and then they stop, etc. But more often than not, unless you're running very long distances, I'm talking, you know, 500, 1,000 feet or more, unless you're running those really long distances and running high numbers of fixtures on those, it just my personal experience and the experience of many people I've worked with is they're not typically necessary. That being said, they're very inexpensive. We have them at the Lord Christmas Lighting Store. Um, you can always plug one in. You can always have one. But don't think if you read the specs, if you see presentations from people, especially in this hobby where they're just kind of reading it off the spec, they say, oh, you have to have a Terminator. 
I would argue against that. It's really not that critical. Um, fixtures don't self-terminate. That's kind of a myth. Maybe one or two over time have, but that's, that's not something that actually happens. But regardless, it's not really necessary. So I hope that helped you understand the basics of DMX for Christmas lighting. At the end of the day, it's actually really not that complicated or hard. I think it's less complicated than pixels. But Moving heads continue to get more and more popular in Christmas lighting, and so I hope this video, if you find it, is helpful to you in understanding how this stuff works, how it goes together. It's really not that complicated. And of course, if you need moving heads, uh, we at Learn Christmas Lighting from Above AVL are your place for moving heads. We were one of the earlier vendors to get into the game. We offer a real warranty where we actually fix your fixture instead of just throwing some parts at you randomly. And uh, we take really great care of our people and you'll find, surprisingly, that our fixtures are not that much more expensive than the stuff that comes straight off the boat where you get a real manual, a real X-Lights model created by us, real support, and a real warranty. So if that sounds good to you, check us out at the Learn Christmas Lighting Store and stay tuned for more and more stuff. Rumor has it there might be a new fixture, a new light that's a game changer for moving heads in Christmas lighting coming out soon. Who knows? We'll have to find out. We'll see you guys there. Thanks.